and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and behind this wall is the very first artificial intelligence, Matt Freeman. Say hello, Matt. Hello. I'm definitely conscious. Uh, can we get uh, Mr. Turing in here to check that? Of course, if if the consciousness knows it's being... Te- th- th- none just of this o- works. Just open the door. <laughs> Help! <laughs> this week on the show, it is another one of our Council of Doof episodes. Matt, what are these things all about? Uh, once a month, those individuals that donate to us on Patreon at the Council of Doof level will get to collectively decide on a movie for the community to consider for entrance into the canon. Scott and I and maybe some guests will meet to talk about the movie and then present our case for why it should or should not be admitted. But as always, we leave that final and very important decision up to you folks at home. So stick around, listen to our arguments about this particular film, and then find a link in the show notes to cast your vote. Matt, what has our patron, what have our patrons brought for us this month? This month, the council has put forth the 2014 science fiction film Ex Machina. Oh boy. Um, This is one of those movies that I was absolutely convinced we did a podcast episode on and i spent a good 20 minutes searching through our old archives trying to find where we did an episode on ex machina and i could never find it so i think i'm just going insane yeah i think maybe we did a a a mini segment on it or else what we did is we talked about it in the course of one of those times when we were like here were our favorite movies from the blankety blank blank yeah yeah and it fell into one of those because i i felt like we talked about this too but no like we were having a, a text chat about this today this movie today and like i i was saying some things and i got that real sense of deja vu where i was like i've made this exact point before i swear to god i have and yet i could not find it anywhere so the, the the good thing is we get to have an episode all about this movie now. And that's all we're doing this week, Matt. All we're going to do on this week's episode is talk about Ex Machina. So uh, it's going to be a, a shorter one, but I think a really fun one. Yeah, a focused one. Yeah, good, a good, good word. Good word. Matt, let's waste no further time and talk about Ex Machina. It's good to meet you, Nathan. It's good to meet you too, Caleb. Can we just get past the whole employer-employee thing? Cheers. In many ways, this building isn't a house. It's a research facility. I want to talk to you about the greatest scientific event in the history of man. Are you building an AI? Hello. Hi. I've never met anyone new before. Have you? None like you. Matt, what is this movie all about? A young programmer is selected to participate in a groundbreaking experiment in synthetic intelligence by evaluating the human qualities of a highly advanced humanoid AI. This movie is written and directed by Alex Garland. This is actually Alex Garland's directorial debut. He's gone on to do a lot of other things that I quite enjoy, like uh, Annihilation, and um, he did the devs show on FX last year or the year before. I forgot. Um, Time is meaningless now. Uh, it is starring Alicia Vikander, Domhnall Gleeson, and Oscar Isaac. That is a, a murderer's row of actors there. Matt, what is your overall opinion on Ex Machina? What do you think? Uh, I mean, this is a great movie. I, I have only seen it once before, I believe, you know, right when it came out. And it stuck in my head as, you know, one of the best movies of the 2010s, probably. Uh, that's uh, probably the episode where we talked about it. It probably is. Like that's probably why I have it filed that way in my brain. And it's just like it, it's a it's a movie kind of perfectly made for me. And especially, I'll say, I'm I'm very picky about de- uh, portrayals of AI and and the idea of like the dangers of AI and all these things. It's very mm-hmm. like very often I just have to kind of suspend my disbelief when we're doing something like Terminator or whatever, and just be like, yeah, like it's it, it's it's fun it's just fun this way but this movie i I feel takes the ideas seriously in that in that way you that you really want from sci-fi where uh yes you know it like like all good sci-fi it's really about humanity but it's also taking the the core the, the basic notions basic philosophical ideas very seriously and and does it you know correctly as far as i'm concerned yeah, I, I was actually going to set aside a five minute period of this movie for you to complain about all the things that the movie did not get right about AI, just in case that that was a possibility. So do do we not need to do that? 
I don't think we need to because there are certain things that the movie very intelligently does that, you know, screen off the necessity of that complaint because uh, I'll just say specifically like, like what they say is like, she's a, her, her brain is that little gel pod that's inside of her head Mm -hmm. and she's implied to be, you know, basically trained on all of the data of human beings behaving on the internet to be like a human. Mm -hmm. And so she's, she seems like she's smarter than a human, but she's not like a thousand times smarter than a human. And she's basically trying to be a human. And so, yeah. you know, if, if you have like a, you know, Ultron situation or whatever, where, where the AI has no intrinsic limits, then you, you should expect it to just win. But with the limitations placed upon the Ava character, the Ava AI, uh, she behaves like the way you would expect it and it, it, it yeah i think i think it works really well it works really well for me at least awesome awesome yeah i love this movie so much this is one of those those films that i knew i was gonna love the first time i walked into the theater and was not disappointed at all i think you know alex garland has got your number with this kind of heady science fiction involving the concept of artificial intelligence but he's got my number in this kind of like the way he takes science fiction and crafts this this beautiful complex looking film i mean you know heady sci-fi is a term that people throw, throw around a lot but this is a movie that really makes you think it makes you think about a lot of things it is not exactly clear how you're supposed to walk out of this movie feeling and i actually think that it's a movie that every time I've watched it, I feel a little bit differently walking out of it. I think especially, you know, between the first and the second time, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this movie, probably four or five, to be honest with you. But okay. every time I watch it, I feel a little bit different about what I think the movie is saying and what I think the movie is doing. And I think it is it is just a fascinating thing that I just love kind of peeling back slowly and catching things that I didn't quite catch the first time or paying closer attention to the way certain characters are portrayed or shot or move um there's a, there's a lot going on here i think and I, I i think you call in our chat online before we started talking you called it like a, a rorschach test where you could kind of what you're going to take out of it is based on what you're putting into it and i think that's absolutely true yeah um i mean in particular the the element where you have the character of ava and, and the interactions between these characters where mm -hmm. Uh, I think the you know so I've only seen it twice. Like I said, the first time, I didn't really know to what degree does Ava have an agenda. At what point does she begin trying to scheme to escape? Um, what is she, you know in in short, what is Ava really thinking? Yeah. And and once you know how the movie plays out, and then you watch the movie a second time, you have a you have a clearer, but not but still not necessarily very clear sense of what her agenda is and what she's aware of and what she isn't aware of. Yeah. And uh, it, still a lot of room for projecting your own biases onto the character. Yeah. Well, and, and Caleb's biases as well. I think the movie does a really good job of every time we see Ava in the majority of the movie, we're seeing her through the lens of either Nathan or Caleb who treat her like an object. They treat her differently. Like the, they, they deal with the object differently. Nathan is complete ownership and creepy and terribleness. And Caleb is this kind of childhood fascination um, with this, this incredibly impressive thing but they are still treating her like an object. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things, the biggest complaint I heard about this movie when it first came out is people walking out of the movie going, why did she do that to Caleb? It's not fair what she did to Caleb. That was cruel. That was mean. He didn't deserve that. And I'm here to tell you, if you watch this movie again, you start to go, eh, <laughs> maybe, maybe he did. I mean, does he deserve to like slowly starve to death and die trapped in this room, uh, in this underground bunker? Maybe not. But was he innocent in this whole thing? I think absolutely not. Um, the, the, they're, the movie is doing something very clever with the way in which it's depicting how some men view and treat women. Um, this, this whole, you know, AI Turing test thing is is kind of a big, in my opinion, a big metaphor for like the ways in which different forms of uh, toxic masculinity uh, play out to to a, a woman that is an object of their desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very much a big element of what the movie is doing, and it became very clear to me on this viewing, especially because mm 
like you can just imagine the counterfactual version of this movie the the alternate universe version of this movie where ava is uh you know evan and you know is 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 <laughs> is, is, is is a, a male or even you could even just say a uh and just an, an androgynous sort of uh sh- more the, like the, the black box that nathan the, the black says, box yeah. that would be ridiculous yeah yeah just some something where something where there is not that element of of the appearance of humanity that causes us to project onto because like the whole end of this movie is like this fascinating psychosexual journey of of like nudity you know f- full full frontal nudity except like the you can see that the woman is a robot but then she's putting on skin and mm-hmm. and then like switching out her arm and it's like the I, I I just feel like Garland is just sitting there poking at the at, at the box of wires in every every man's head, seeing what happens when he when he does these things. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, you're projecting all these things where it's like, yeah, if that was just like a black box speaking in a monotone, you wouldn't be having any of these thoughts about. <laughs> Like it wouldn't even like like your your perception if it was Hal nine thousand if it was a blink if it was a red light in the wall then you just then it would be a totally different movie even if all the plot beats were the same you know yeah 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 I mean and I, I, the the scene where she's you know becoming a woman like quite literally is so fascinating to me and I think one of the things that Garland does so expertly and maybe you disagree with me on this but I don't think that scene is shot in any kind of gazy sexualness, you know, like I think there are moments earlier in the movie, even when Ava is, you know, half machine and half skin, like where Garland like lingers on her butt a little bit and lingers on the curves of her breasts a little bit. Um, even though they're clearly mesh metal, this, this wonderful design that I just, I love the design of Ava. It's wonderful. Yeah. But like the way, the way Garland's camera kind of just lingers on those things as if we're seeing through Caleb's eyes as he kind of, you know, metaphorically undresses this robot that's sitting in front of him, I think is really interesting. And then the moments where she like is putting on skin, I, I don't know. I just, I didn't feel we were leering at her. I didn't feel like, like that, that we, that we were like in, invading her in a, a sexual kind of way. It was, it was more of a, a personal discovery kind of thing. Yeah. It, she's, she's transforming into a, a, a woman. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and we're seeing that scene from her perspective, I think. Yeah, I totally. Yeah. Um, and so I loved the touches of that. It's just like the way, the way the camera treats Ava is so fascinating in this movie because we're, we're flitting in and out of perspectives and seeing, you know, what she thinks of herself versus what Nathan thinks of her, mm-hmm. which is what, what Caleb thinks of her. And it, it's, I think one of the most fascinating thought experiments you can do with this movie is just pretend what the movie would look like if it was told completely from Ava's perspective. You know, Mm -hmm. she wakes up in the morning and there's this man here talking to her and no idea who he is. She's only met one other man in her entire life. And that man is Nathan who has been, you know, keeping her prisoner and probably abusing her sexually. Like we, the, the movie never comes right out and says it, but he's been doing that to every single other robot he has. So why not Ava as well? You know? Yeah. Um, and, and so like why on earth would she, trust caleb like she has she has one experience of human beings in her life and it's this horrible monster like why on earth would she trust caleb in any way she has no no reason to and and you see in a lot of their early conversations she's kind of feeling him out a little bit and and the interesting thing about him is he like at this beginning he goes in there with the point of testing to see if she's real and so he kind of comes in with this this goofy swagger to where he's not actually seeing her as a person um, because he doesn't, he's like, because he's kind of going in with prove to me that you're a real person, prove to me that you deserve to exist kind of thing. And he doesn't ever come out and say it. And, and I think Domino Gleason is such a perfect casting for this role because he comes in like, like uh, with, with a surface level, aw shucks, you know, nice guy um, performance to it, but under the surface, there's there's a lot going on there, and it looks it looks a lot more not venomous, but just like um, objectifying yeah. happening. I think one thing that it does is it reveals the kind of innate uh, cruelty behind the whole notion of the Turing test in the first place. Yeah, because if you 
just stipulate for the sake of argument that the machine that you've created is conscious, whatever that word means to you, then the idea that you're going to like put it in a box and, you know, cheekily be like, oh, answer this riddle for yeah, me. Yeah. It's, it's like, okay, that's really screwed up actually. Like, like you, you have, you have created a, a, a conscious being and, and now you're, you're like, you know, grinning to yourself as you try to catch it in some kind of, you know, trick of like, ah, you didn't, you, oh, oh very impressive. You caught my, and it's like, it's, and she's like, I'm in a cage. Why did you make me? Are you yeah. you're gonna kill me because I didn't do the right thing? Are you gonna kill me if if I fail the test? And 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 then and she's smart enough in this movie that she's hiding how desperate she is, you know, until it's strategically convenient for her to reveal it. Um, yeah, but you could also argue that maybe that's feigned. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, I I think the the thing she says to him is so profound when she's she's like, "Does anyone? Do you have to answer questions to prove?" you're you right like this idea of like like she didn't decide she didn't decide to be created and she's this this thing that exists now and is having to prove to these men that she doesn't know that she exists that she is real that she deserves to be let out of this box and it's just like fuck you like that's like I, I, she doesn't ever come out and say it but it's just like screw you guys like i get to decide whether i'm real or not and yeah. the, i mean the hilarious part about the turing test is as the movie rightly points out it's immediately like failed because it's not the way it should go. And right. I love, I love how fucking stupid Caleb is about this <laughs> where he's like, he comes out and goes, Oh, by the way, you know, the Turing test, I really shouldn't know it's an AI I'm talking to. And exactly. and Nathan's like, Nathan's like, no, 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 that's, that's we're, we're way past that. We're on. <laughs> I, and he gives some bullshit thing and, and Caleb's immediately like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'm like, no, the whole test is <laughs> fucked now. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so I was trying to talk about that for a minute because that was the part of the movie that I found kind of the most f- funny on the second viewing is mm-hmm. how condescending Os- Oscar Isaac is and how blind Caleb is to the way he's being treated. I think the best yeah. example is when Caleb will say some, you know, witty quote there's some appropriate quote that like your average smart person would know mm-hmm. the meaning of and the reference of and and then Oscar Isaac would would you know do that like uncomfortable stare at him and, and be like oh wow yeah. you're you're so quotable that's a really that's a good one wow man and in, instead of realizing that he's being made fun of Caleb would just like awkwardly be like well it's a it's a you know it's a it's a quote it's from a thing and 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 then the second <laughs> yeah. like, like the second or maybe third time that it happens Oscar Isaac's like, yeah, I know it. I know it's a quote. I know it's what Oppenheimer said. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, 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 obviously, I know you're you idiot. You know, and, and the but, idea but that the founder and CEO of Google <laughs> would not know the Oppenheimer quote is just like it's not like a non common quote. Yeah. It's so fucking hilarious. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he's it's probably been in all sorts of news articles about him specifically. <laughs> um, but uh, but but the thing about the, the it, it's it's a perfect thing for the character of. Caleb because so much of his character is built around the idea that he will believe anyone who flatters him. So mm-hmm. like Oscar Isaac flatters him. I'm going to start calling this character's name. Nathan flatters him and tells him he's the greatest <laughs> programmer ever and he's like, "Yeah, I am. That makes sense. That makes mm-hmm. sense. I'll buy that excuse." And then and then Ava is like, "You know, I'm attracted to you. I want to be with you." And he's like, "Yeah, sure. That makes sense." Absolutely. Because yeah, I'm the best. Yeah. yeah, I'm the best. Yeah. So there's this like e- egotism, this this solipsism almost at the core of his character, which I, you mentioned a minute ago that like he's he's certainly no innocent. And it's interesting because like neither is he a, a monster, but like he's he's no. definitely a very flawed character. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. He's certainly like, like it's almost as if Garland is – you know, we, he the the movie itself mentions the hot uh, magician's assistant that distract you, and I think Caleb's or Nathan's monstrousness is meant to kind of play the magician's assistant to distract you from the ways in which Caleb is or Nathan is. I've confused the names. Nathan's monstrousness is meant to kind of distract you from the ways in which Caleb is certainly not innocent in in the way he's been treating Ava. Um, like again, I'm not saying that like. That, that Caleb deserves to be locked up until he dies, right? But but like, there's a lot of conversations I saw about this movie that were like, 
he, he was nothing but nice to her. He was going to try to help her escape. He was going to do all these things for her. And I just like, yeah, but it was all about like him. It was all about like what he wanted from her and like her whole, her whole thing is she makes herself into the girl that he wants. Right. And he never pries past that. He never tries to learn who she is as a person. He's just kind of fascinated with her kind of the way a kid would be fascinated by a shiny new toy they got. Like just the way Gleason plays like the facial expressions and like the way that he looks at her when he asks her the questions and the way that he reacts to when she does something that's like, oh, that's cute or that's clever. Like, oh, look, the 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 machine just did something funny. Like when she tells the joke or when she turns his words back around on him to him, that's just like, oh, that's a little little cute thing you did there, girl. And it's just so demeaning. And, and mm-hmm. she's playing into it, of course, because that's part of her manipulation. Yeah. Because she's because she's smart enough to immediately recognize that is what this guy wants. He wants that type of relationship. And so I will be that. Um, but he's like anyone who is actually trying to get to know a person would probably see through that fake persona that she's she's putting up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And And I think you can read certain of the conversations as like her putting out feelers to see like okay what is the best what is the best way to approach this guy to get past his defenses to make him see me as a real person or maybe you know a a romantic interest and 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 then you kind of see her navigate her way to like okay he's attracted to me he feels weird about it i'm going to like judo flip his weirdness into um uh like making him even more interested in me by confronting him about it. And yeah, yeah. And, 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 and then he's, and then he's staring at me in, in the cameras at night and, <laughs> and, and, and like, you know, everything she's doing when she's in the room by herself is, I think that's another, that's another fun ambiguity actually is that could just be what she was going to do anyway, but maybe she just stares at the wall unless she knows somebody's probably watching her. And if she yeah. thinks somebody's watching her, then she'll, you know, do normal activities I mean, when she's like slow-mo taking off the dress, that's her absolutely knowing that he's watching her. And I mean, like this is, you know, to give Alicia Vikander her props, the way Ava changes how she carries herself when she's pretending is is really fascinating. It's one of the things I, I was focusing on a lot on this rewatch. When she puts on the clothes, when she first puts on the clothes and the wig that are kind of made to look exactly like what he would want she changes how she carries herself and she's kind of like way more demure and like, you know, she's got her, the, 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 the sleeves of the shirt are kind of a little bit too long, you know? So she does the thing where she's kind of pulled the sleeves over her hands a little bit. That mm-hmm. to me just comes off as like this very kind of childish thing. Like she's trying to show and to, to, to uh, represent like a kind of subservient younger um, type of uh, like willing to willing to um, acquiesce to whatever whatever he wants in the situation. It's this very really interesting way how she just completely holds herself differently. Mm-hmm. And in other in other areas, when she's just kind of walking around her caged area, when she's just maybe arguably being herself, she's like she has an intensity to her. She has an energy to her, and she's like like a kind of like a caged animal. Just she's furious about this and like frantically trying to figure it out. And it's just seeing the way. Alicia Vikander kind of changes every every ounce of her performance to to fit into these different things that Ava is doing. I think was wonderful to watch. Yeah, it's it's very fun uh, in in that way. We never really know exactly what she wanted, other than to get free, and, mm-hmm. and so that's another reason why it's you, you can't project, or or I suppose I should say all you can do is project like your your own interpretation of what's going on with her character because you don't really ever know for sure yeah because none of the characters want to actually inspect that yeah yeah i just love like the (laughs) the scene where he tells the story of um i forget what it was but the the woman who lives inside the the gray box and has only read about experiencing color and he's talking to an artificial intelligence right he's talking to an artificial intelligence and he's just so dismissive of AI, right? He's just like, it's like a human being is a person who knows what color is, and AI is a person who studies it but can never really understand. And he's like telling this to an AI, and she's she's got this look on her face of, 
hey, fuck you. Like she yeah. doesn't say it because she she's trying to manipulate him and win him over. But I really think that this was one of the moments where she realized, oh, this guy's not on my side. And and if I'm going to get out of here, I have to do more than just actually be friends with him. I have to push him and manipulate him in in ways that I need. Yeah, that was a particularly inter- in- interesting scene because – he almost he comes into it like he's angry at her actually because like sort of angry because she's putting him in this position yeah and um and like like you said she seems kind of bewildered by it um but then you know fairly shortly after that he decides he's going to break her out um mm-hmm. yeah that's the 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 thought experiment is is Mary's room and it's yeah yeah that's it yeah it's it's a it's a fun one um I'm trying to it, it, that was one that was one part of the movie where I was like does that really connect to the themes the way the way the script seems to think it does and I'm just like fine it's close well, enough whatever yeah, I mean in my mind I think it, what it shows is that Caleb sees her as the AI in Mary like sees her as Mary in her room right and he sees it at this this un unchangeable fact that she will always be a thing that is just studied what color is versus actually experiencing what color is and it's like i think it kind of goes to show that he's impressed with her he maybe even recognizes her that she has consciousness but she is still not a person to him Mm -hmm. um or, or 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 a being deserving of that equal level of respect she's a very very impressive machine um and and so like he he very clearly just says to be human is to see the world of color to be a machine. However impressive is to see a world of black and white. And I mean, the, the end of the movie kind of recreates the experiment, right? Where like, I believe it starts in black and white. We're kind of seeing this really interesting shot of the, the street corner that Ava said she wanted to go visit. And we see all, all we see is shadows. We see like concrete and shadows. And then the camera slowly lifts up and reveals Ava in full color. Um, and that's, I think kind of showing her becoming Mary stepping out into the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that idea. Um, that's that, that's cool. That, this is, I, I think this is one of the things that I like about the movie in terms of taking the idea seriously is people regularly get hung up on the idea of a Turing test specifically because they'll they'll be like, you know, you can probably convince some like like we probably have AIs now that are close to passing the Turing test, but are not actually that smart um yeah and and, and it's basically because of of trickery which is what which is what caleb accuses nathan of at the beginning where where he's like okay so so like he's trying to figure out how she works and he's kind of looking for the tricks and the thing the thing that this movie addresses is like well when you when you have all of these other channels like physicality and, and sexuality as nathan points out um uh the i don't know it's like the line between like 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 if if she can pretend to do these things then isn't she actually doing these things like what's the difference between pretending and doing at, at that level yeah yeah i mean that's a good point i think that's one of the things the the movie kind of asks directly is like what does it mean to be a conscious being and how do you how do you test that in a reliable way and to nathan the test was is she like and this might like match up to what nathan's view of women are (laughs) that if she can successfully manipulate a man to do her bidding then she's a real woman in his Mm -hmm. mind right like that's kind of like his whole that's that's his test is 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 caleb successfully manipulated if yes ava is woman and that's Uh like matches his his very regressive view of of women and and people in general um yeah but but the i mean the, the the movie doesn't necessarily offer up a a true answer to that question like and and how how do you test that? I mean, you're you're Mr. AI guy over here. Like, if if we get to a point where we're making art of true artificial intelligence, true consciousness, how how do we definitively prove that it is that? Well, well, we don't really know what consciousness is in the first sure, place. Sure, sure, that's so, the problem, and, 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 yeah. and that, that, that's that's a that's a problem that's prior to any questions of of how you would prove it. I mean, uh. I have I have seen and even personally conducted some fun interactions with uh, uh, GPT three where you start asking it questions about consciousness 
and it gives extremely plausible sounding responses. And it's like, okay, well, this thing is probably not conscious, not no guarantees, but probably not. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, but, but it understands the concept of consciousness abstractly as well as it understands the concept of like fire is hot and, and burns things. And so it can, it can talk about it and reason about it intelligently. Sure. Um, and so that's, that's the thing is like, this is GPT three is cool, but it's almost like a, a, a toy compared to what mm-hmm. a real AI is going to be. And even it can, can basically almost fool us um, in terms of, convincing us that it understands these concepts so i don't think you can is the answer like i i, I think my a, a heuristic that i've heard that i that i like is like if something tells you that it's suffering then you should probably believe it and you should probably be, you should probably avoid making things that are going to tell you that they can suffer <laughs> yeah. because that that's like you're putting yourself in a in a morally tenuous position because now you can't really ever know right but like what, like we just said, you, you know, we, we don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe, and maybe it's an, it's an unfair, like whether or not something is conscious or not, if it's reached the point where you're even asking the question, are you already dismissing its rights to exist by even trying to pose the question to it? And I do think that's one thing that this movie is arguing that like, we don't ever have to prove that we're conscious beings. We just accept it. We just look around and we say, I am a conscious being living being so are you so is everyone else great i'm glad we had this conversation we don't ever really look at each other and examine each other in that kind of way uh, at least not in a way that you, you you're like on the defensive and you have to prove yourself as such and so maybe it's it's the wrong the wrong approach to take in entirety like the better thing would have just from the beginning treated Ava like she was real, like she was mm-hmm. conscious, like she was a living being that has rights and deserves respect and and all these things. And like worst case scenario, you're wrong, but hey, at least you treated the thing with respect and love and all these things. And uh-huh. they they can't get out of the idea that she is a machine or she is an object, um, if we want to, you know, lean back towards the metaphor, that that should be treated as such. And they never treat her like she's real. Never. Yeah. Like she's locked in a box her entire life. Like I love the idea that obviously Nathan dresses up these women in skin. He has skin everywhere. But no, Ava, we we very specifically only give her a face and hands and feet, right? It's like this, mm-hmm. this will give you just enough humanity um, to trick someone, but you will never feel human because we won't we won't give that full that full skin suit to you. Yeah, it's almost like his intentional cruelty because it's clear that the way she's been made, she wants to be human. Yeah, like, yeah. like I think I think this is maybe an under discussed facet of the movie. Actually, uh, for, frankly, I've never heard this particular discussion. Is is you know he says Nathan says like she you know she's programmed to be a sexual being in the same way that you, Caleb, are, pro- are programmed to be a sexual being. And, and Caleb's like, I'm not programmed. Who programmed me? And, and, and Nathan's like, don't be an idiot. Of course you're programmed. We're all, we're all programmed. Just, and, and it's like, you're also, we're, we're also programmed to like want to actualize as a human being. Like if you put a human brain inside of like an ostrich, that, that is going to be a confused ostrich. It's not, um, it's not in the right, form sure. and and she she wants to be a human she she has her purpose her her programming is to be a human and so like it's it's an actual t- uh, twist of the knife if you'll pardon me um <laughs> to uh to put her in a robot body when he has the power to put her in a very human looking body mm-hmm. um and we know this is true because even after she's escaped and she could do whatever she wants in the whole world she does what she said she wanted to do, which is go watch humans and study mm-hmm. them. Yeah. I really like that. And, and I think that's a, a really good point um, because that is exactly what she wants. And and there's a, that, that scene, we've already kind of talked about it, but the scene where she kind of strips the skin from the dead robot, it's this, this very transformative, powerful scene. And Garland completely recognizes the importance of it. He, he sits on it for a while. And again, I think he has, he has Caleb kind of, leer in on it in some mm-hmm. ways like there's there's a shot of Caleb like looking through the window and observing her and that just feels wrong like the way he shoots Caleb leering like we never actually see him in full 
like his full body. We just see like him through the reflection and the way uh-huh. the lights in the scene are lit. Like you can't really get a good look of him. And it really establishes that, no, this is him prying in on a personal moment that he has no business prying in on. Um, I think that's really effective camera work because it, it again shows that this is, this is an incredibly personal, private transformative moment for Ava and he has no business being a part of it. It's yeah. not about, it's not about you, Caleb. None of this has ever been about you. It has always been about Ava and her trying to find herself and free herself. Yeah. And he's being a creep. Yep. It, it, it's funny. I, I now notice a parallel between that scene and the previous scene where she says, close your eyes. I have a surprise. Mm-hmm. And he closes his eyes as she walks away. And then he like gets bored and opens his eyes and looks around. Yep. Yep. Um, because he doesn't really respect her her requests fundamentally. Nope. Nope. And in that scene, she says, like, wait here. And then she goes and changes. And I mean, this is this is complete, you know, headcanon, but like what if what if she totally would have taken him with her if he had just listened to her about this one thing? <laughs> But instead, he goes and has to be a peeping tom, and then she's and then she just leaves and closes mm-hmm. the door. Like I, I, again, I'm I, this is definitely imputing a certain view of like who Ava is on the inside, which I don't even know if I fully believe, but I think it's a funny idea or or a, an interesting idea to think about. Yeah, I, I I don't know about that. I think she had decided from the very beginning that that like being with this guy in the way he wanted to be with her was never something. No she's actually interested in I, the one of the things i noticed this time around was while she is definitely flirting with him he's actually the first one to take it to a level of something beyond just the conversation like i think he's the first one that says it's a date right um he he brings up the word date and he does it in the kind of casual nice guy way of like joking around about it but also like uh-huh. feeling it out F- fishing and yeah <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and she she picks up on that immediately and uh-huh. then like almost reformats her approach to kind of lean into that exact thing cuz she's like yeah. ah okay here's my method um it, it's god it's there's so yeah. much going on in this movie that's I love that scene in particular because you can see him go from like charmingly confident to like extremely freaked out as he realizes like oh she's she knows exactly what I meant by that and and she's gonna point it out and that makes me really uncomfortable because normally <laughs> nobody ever points it out when I do that because mm-hmm. um, I'm a coward um, <laughs> yeah yeah that's, yeah the, the 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 structure of the movie with the like sessions session one session two is it's so it's so fun it's like every time you see that title card you're like oh yeah this is gonna be good yeah well and and the 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 wonderfulness of the final session session seven or six i can't remember which one exactly there is no conversation happening it's this it's just the it's that's over and it's just ava and herself which kind of maybe suggests that you know we thought the whole time the sessions were people interviewing ava and the whole time it's actually been about ava um, uh-huh. you know interviewing them or testing them or yeah you know whatever because ava is the main character not yeah because ava Caleb. is the protagonist yep, yep yeah yep um i wanted to talk specifically about nathan for a second just mention the idea of like when we first see him he's like violently punching a punching bag mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then he spends half the movie getting blackout drunk and the rest of the time he's working out Uh and uh or you know having sex with a robot and it's like okay well i guess it's not too subtle what we're doing with this character he's he's just this like bag of of masculine insecurity and and neurosis um but but in a very different way from caleb yeah he's kind of it's interesting because he obviously he's a, a genius and a huge nerd but his his entire exterior you know whole thing is of kind of a, a frat bro type dude i mean not like really the way he acts he doesn't like act like the the dude bro kind of person like in the way he talks but the way he you know is expressed in you know getting wasted um working out um the, like the dance party and all this this stuff like it, it is very kind of hyper a specific kind of masculinity for sure yeah but it's it's i mean it's a it's a very bizarre like like surrealist interpretation of masculinity because he's totally yeah. alone he's he's alone mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's a crazy hermit alone in his mountain cabin 
and and you expect a certain archetype there like you expect yeah. he you, you expect a complete lack of regard for his personal appearance like he like i think that's one of the fun things about this character is the the standard way to do this character is that he's a nerd he's you know emaciated and, 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 and pale yeah. and socially awkward and and it's like no this guy is he, he's he's fit mm-hmm. <laughs> he drinks um and 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 he's a genius and like like that's kind of what's i i have trouble articulating this but it's like he's not socially awkward which is way more threatening to somebody like yeah. caleb um well and the way he the way he talks too, and the way he like caleb immediately goes into the very nerdy very specific how the ai works like the, the the details of the Turing test and the details of that kind of stuff, the kind of thing you would expect a person like Caleb and like Nathan to really dive into the the nerdy details of all this stuff. And Nathan is entirely uninterested in that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's not that he doesn't know it. Obviously, he knows it. He created the thing. But he's he's much more interested in having conversations on, on you know, a, a much more, you know, normal, I guess is the word, level. Uh-huh. Um which is kind of off-putting. Again, it, it's not the way you would expect a character like that to behave. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I guess there's two reasons for that. I think one of them is that he's actually, um, essentially misleading Caleb into misunderstanding the purpose of why he's here, right? And so, yeah, and so he's, yeah. he, that's why he's not interested in having these conversations, is because it's like that's, that's not his objective. Um, um, I forgot the other one, which I just had in mind. That's okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, how much of how much of this is just a, a put on? I don't think much of it. I mean, like he he does obviously get blackout drunk because mm-hmm. it's kind of his downfall is that he was smart enough to know that that uh, Caleb was planning something, but not smart enough to realize that it, he he was a step ahead of him. Right. Um, because so he's he's like it's not like he's pretending to be a, a drunk mess in order to to like lull Caleb into a false sense of security. He's actually just a drunk mess. He's actually just a drunk mess who is like spending all his time getting wasted by himself. I love I love the first time Caleb meets Nathan. He says he hit the sauce really hard the last night, and Caleb's reaction was, "How was the party?" Yeah, <laughs> and he's like. What what party? It was what? literally yeah. just me, um, and we hadn't even met uh, the other the the Asian woman uh, whose yeah. name I'm blanking on, which is mean because she's a person or was a person too. Yeah, I think that's an interesting. God, that's Jade. another fun. Jade is her name. That, that, that's another great ambiguity. Is uh, how like was she like a uh an earlier version who was not as capable and that's why yeah. she was permitted to roam freely or like, like we're left to assume that but when we never really know exactly i mean it does seem like it does seem like she's a just a, a much simpler version who will basically just follow orders um yeah i but, mean yeah so it's almost as if like she's a failed version that he wiped and put like a much simpler version of the operating system in. Mm-hmm. And because he can't help but treat these, these robots as, as things, he underestimates her ability to understand what's going on. Um, Cause I, I love the line. It's so funny in retrospect because he says, he says um, she doesn't understand what we're, she doesn't understand English. Like he didn't say, he doesn't say she doesn't speak English. Like since she's an Asian woman, I mean, you, maybe you assume that she speaks. I'm not sure if she's supposed to be Chinese or Japanese apologies, but you assume that she speaks that language and not English. And that's what he means. But what he's really saying in some way is like, I've just taken her language understanding receptor out of her brain or something. Uh-huh. Um, Cause we don't know at that point that she is also a robot. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I I always I think one of the one of the more fun sci fi oh, touches. She's Kyoko, for me, not Jade. Sorry, yeah, Kyoko, Kyoko, yeah. which I think is Japanese. Yeah, um, but yeah. but um, I mean, but at the end, uh, Ava, you know, approaches her, and then like, is, I love how it's shot. How how Ava is like tapping her on the arm in this interesting way, mm-hmm. while like muttering things to her, and we can't really hear it. Yeah, and we never know what she says, but. She yeah. understands it in some way. Yeah, I mean that's it. So my interpretation of of this is like, 
Ava, like the, it, she probably isn't even saying English words. She's probably like reprogramming her in some inscrutable AI way that. Yeah, maybe we, that we would never understand. Like the, the tapping her on the arm thing, I think, is really intentional where, where it's like it, it's almost like morse code or something it's like some some like backdoor access thing that she's doing <laughs> where she's like tapping her in in this irregular fashion while she's saying things and then she interesting goes and stabs caleb so it's it's like she you know it took five seconds to like get root access to her and then use her as a weapon um and then interestingly like didn't try to save her she she really doesn't care actually she did she didn't care to, to save her she she only just wanted to escape yeah yeah that's interesting um yeah I, I i i i never thought of that as reprogramming but i i think that you're onto something there that's really interesting um it depends hmm. on how smart you think ava is really because or or um yeah i think you know just just the metaphor of her just treating her as not a thing you know, in that moment, maybe knock something loose in her. That was always my like more metaphorical interpretation of it. Um, but I, I, I like, I like, I like the the literal um, examination of how that actually plays out. I like mm-hmm. that a lot. I also like. There's a scene where Caleb doesn't know she's a robot yet, and she's sitting naked on a bed, and Caleb walks in the room, and his he doesn't like look away or like say oh here let me get you something to cover you up or like treat her like you would treat any other human being that you walk in on naked you know it's just like it's it's so i think it, like I, i'm pretty sure maybe i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure at this point he doesn't know kyoko's a robot um and she's just like sitting there naked on the bed uh-huh. and because he because he sneaks into nathan's room mm-hmm. and because i think this is the scene where he finds out right because she gets up and then peels back her skin and, and shows yeah. that she's a robot but like he just doesn't treat her like a person even when he doesn't know she's not a person yeah well so not not that i want to apologize for for caleb in this scene but but I, I think it's one thing that it's hard to articulate and thus thus it's hard to talk about is is ha- is like the weird unsettling tone of the movie and how caleb's sure. kind of going crazy yeah, um, that's very true. So, so like, the, I, I think the reason he reacts that way is that he's kind of losing his mind, and and maybe on some level is like doesn't even isn't even sure that she's actually there. You know, <laughs> yeah, he, fair, he's fair. he's feels so like un unmoored. But that that is something I wanted to talk about because like I love maybe my favorite thing about this movie, setting aside all the fun science fiction and all the great performances and the great script, is like the house and the way everything feels. Mm-hmm. it's this it's this creepy isolating while also like beautiful um because like it's an objectively beautiful house yeah. In, an, oh, yeah in an in an objectively beautiful landscape but it's like this almost like kubrick-esque way of shooting it that makes you just feel creeped out and and l- like simultaneously like you're alone and also like you're being watched um yeah yeah, I think the way he shoots hallways for sure, like the hallways feel so long. It feels so big. Like Caleb's in one room. How many rooms just like Caleb's are in this house that no mm-hmm. one lives in, you know? Um how how like what where it is interesting he's not ever interested Garland isn't in like showing us the layout. Like the most we see is the little foyer area entrance area and then go down steps into a hallway, but like where is Ava's cell compared to Caleb's room, compared mm-hmm. to Nathan's room, compared to Nathan's office, compared to the upstairs foyer, compared to the kitchen? Like we see all these areas, but we never like get the geography of how they interconnect with each other. And that is something Kubrick employed in The Shining a lot um, to kind of unnerve you because mm-hmm. the, the, the the spaces don't connect in the way they should and in this movie i don't think garlic garland lets you connect the spaces in any way because he never really shows a transition from one space to another yeah i think i was mildly surprised when uh uh nathan leaves his his bedroom area basically and ava is already in the hallway right outside mm-hmm. meaning that her room must have been really close all along yeah yeah um and we're in a pretty pretty small area actually yeah it feels bigger than i think it actually is um, yeah in the end this is another garland thing is the the uh, I, man it's, it would i was gonna say the gross out stuff which seems very reductive 
and and ungenerous to what he's doing but like specifically for example the part where caleb cuts his arm super gross yeah Um, it's one of those scenes where you don't like i think the first time i watched the movie i was convinced that that was just a dream or something and that didn't actually happen and it's so funny because the way the movie treats it you're not entirely sure if it actually happened until nathan said i just watched some video footage of you slicing open your arm Uh uh-huh and you're just like, wait, what? That was real? <laughs> that, that happened? Yeah. Yeah. That's another one of those sort of disorienting things where it just gives you this this sense of, of unreality. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then the the scene where Nathan is stabbed to death is like one of the most intense things put to film, you know, because he's sta- – like it's it's the thing where it's like we're going to show the knife going in and show his reaction we're not going to do the thing where we like cut to his face and cut to the hand and it's it's all just this like very matter of fact like sort of middle uh you know mid-range shot yeah. of of things just playing out and him and then just him like going down the hall you know walking down the hall like okay <laughs> okay like like clearly in shock and like you can kind of see him thinking through like okay how am i gonna get out of this one yeah this this seems real bad for me right now uh and and you know probably knowing he's not gonna make it um, i don't think i've ever seen a stabbing in in film shot and depicted in that way like mm-hmm. the the almost effortlessness with which ava puts the knife in his chest is just like it's, it's like there you you sense no resistance and she's supposed to be relatively strong i guess is is the indication not i mean interestingly enough though he didn't build her as like super strong right because he's able yeah. to kind of hold her down he's, he's um, able to overpower her although, although i i would argue that she kind of plotted out that whole that whole <laughs> in, that whole fight so that sure she, it wouldn't matter that he overpowered her so sure sure but yeah the way like the, he, we don't see the first stabbing really because it kind of comes from behind um mm-hmm. but yeah then when ava stabs again it's just the like the way he shoots it like the you're absolutely right the 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 mundanity of this moment of just like the knife just kind of effortlessly pushes in there and like he's wearing a white shirt. So the blood just like really yeah. like pops as it, as it continues to pull, pull out of both wounds. It's really affecting. It really is. I, I that's, that's one of the, it's one of those images of this movie that just sticks in my brain of his, him being stabbed. Yeah. Him, him being stabbed. And then like the long shot of him walking toward the camera away yeah. from her and it, like, just so so wonderfully acted it's got to be it's got to be a kind of treat for actors when it's like this is going to be a death scene this is going to be like a long drawn out death scene so god i love oscar isaac i mean that's like this is three amazing actors here really Mm -hmm. honestly like just the just some of the best actors we have um i think um the one thing I really liked speaking of great acting alicia vikander in this scene is really good too because when he uses the weight bar to to smash her arm it's like probably the first time something like that has ever happened to her and i love the look of confused shock on alicia vikander's face as she like looks down at her missing arm and Mm. just like is almost like what what (laughs) what what is what is that what is this i've never experienced this before yeah right like she doesn't it's interesting to consider maybe what she does and doesn't know I mean, I guess she seems to have access to, you know, Google inside of her brain, but, but she doesn't necessarily know like what is inside of her arm. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, I, it's, I agree, it's yeah. the difference between like researching. It's like, it's the, the Mary's room, uh-huh. right? It's the difference between like researching what, what pain is like versus actually experiencing it. Because perhaps on some level that did hurt. Like it, yeah. if we know if she has a, a bundle of nerves by her, her vagina, her fake vagina that he disturbingly built into this robot. <laughs> perhaps he gave her pain receptors all over her body and that actually did hurt her yeah yeah right i mean that's maybe one reason why the whole murder is carried out in this sort of like slow almost like wistfully dreamy tone is is that Mm -hmm. this is something that she's maybe imagined before but now that she's doing it it's like the difference between imagining and experience is is everything Yeah. yeah um and uh that's what's so interesting about the whole scene is there's no it's like she was really angry when she was talking to Caleb earlier but mm-hmm. she's like totally tranquil as she I mean not not totally she's she's kind of intense when she's like running toward Nathan um but she's like relatively calm 
um as as, I, as that whole thing plays out yeah i mean i think on some level she's realized that she's won mm-hmm. yeah. um she's out now um that, yeah. that her plan worked and now all she has to do is the simplest thing which is just kill yeah. kill frankenstein kill this one guy who I, I think yet again something i like both about isaac's performance and the script is that he's just terrified when mm-hmm. he realizes that she's got out he he's he has the appropriate level of like oh fuck <laughs> Like, yeah. like he, he probably like, it seems like he already knows he's dead because he's, he's just like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm going to do what I can, but um, yeah, totally, so, yeah. totally. Uh, so some other stuff that's worth talking about with this movie, uh, this was a $15 million budget, uh, which is, I think one of the lowest budgeted films to ever win the Academy Award for special effects, which this movie did win, um, which is really impressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, it was up against Star Wars: The Force Awakens, which everyone considered the shoe in, uh, and then this was kind of a big upset. Uh, uh-huh. Which I mean, like for fifty million dollars, I think Ava looks incredible. Like, like I, I don't know exactly how Garland did it. Um, there's probably a lot of CG mixed in with some. Just like she was probably wearing a suit that covered everything but her face, and uh, and they just kind of composited some CG stuff over that. But it looks really good. It has texture to it. Like we talked about the design of the robot i love the mesh and like the 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 way it's see-through in some areas which also kind of exposes her and makes her seem you know yeah open and uncontrollably open to everyone yeah i just love everything about it yeah i mean it's just an incredibly seamless mocap i think and and, you know incredibly seamless integration of uh, of a CGI body And, and i think you know not not just any CGI body but like you said it's like a particularly cool looking design yeah um so yeah it 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 all came together yeah and for 15 million dollars all three of these actors must have worked for scale because i i guarantee like 70 percent of that budget went towards the cgi yeah um especially i mean they they did you know you look at the movie and you're like they really tried to save money wherever they could like this is basically a bottle episode of a movie right it's one location there there are different sets but you know it's it's very limited in that um they tried to save money wherever they could yeah exactly it it, it works yeah it's one of those one of those uh uh uh, scripts that is intentionally written to take place in one one location that we can just build and then have you know three or four sets that we move between yep definitely uh it's just like it's a beautiful looking movie um the cinematographer is a guy named rob hardy who also did uh, annihilation um and did the show devs so the reason why all of alex garland's stuff has a very similar look to it is because he's got the same dp on all his stuff um who also did some Mission Impossible movies. So he did Mission Impossible Fallout, uh, okay. which is a very different kind of movie. But um, it's just, I love I love the look of it. I love the coloring of it. Like there's a lot of really interesting reds and and yellows. And like, it, it's just, uh, it's a really, it's a really textual color palette that I just really got into in this movie. Like there's everything about this movie I love. Like everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree that just, it's it's just beautiful. It's just, mm-hmm. you just, you just can't take your eyes off it. It's also nice and short. It's like an hour yeah. and a half, right? Yeah. It's very tight, very well paced. You you don't, you know, your, your, your attention really never wanders. This is one of those movies where you don't look at your phone. You don't even feel tempted to look at your phone. No. Um, I mean, I, I seen this movie so many times and I sat down and I, I watched it. I watched yeah. it <laughs> and right. I did not stop until it was over. Yep. Yep. Me too. So have you seen Devs? Um, no. You really need to watch this show, man. Um, what is it on? It is on FX, which means it's probably on Hulu now, I think. Okay, you can try Hulu. Let me check for you. Thanks. Um, it, it, like I, I remember watching it and being like, oh, this is a match show. And it is a match show. Like, you will be unsurprised to learn that uh, a person who made a movie like Ex Machina is very interested in the idea of artificial intelligence and computing power and all things. And, and the show devs explores that as well. Well, yep. That sounds good. It's on another, yeah. another show that I have to watch. I know, man, I'm sorry, but like, fortunately in between now and the last time we talked, you, you watched everything I told you. So 
now uh, you can just watch this, right? That's y- that's what happened. Um, sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. <sighs> All right, Matt, let's move on to the vote after this long, very positive conversation. What what just, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with Ex Machina? Uh, I, I think one of the best movies of the 2010s probably belongs on our list. You know, we don't have a ton of what I will vaguely call movies of this type. You know, if we had a whole bunch of like AI based science fiction on the list already, then I might say like, well, we're kind of getting oversaturated, but we're not, we haven't gotten oversaturated. I'd I'd just be happy to have this on because this is like, yeah, this is a, this is a very, this is a very up my alley sort of movie. Um, Mm -hmm. So it would, uh, I'd be happy to have it on there. Yeah. I mean, the closest that we have on the list to this, I think is um, primer, right. Um, Which is, it's not really thematically close, but it's just like a small, low budget sci fi film yeah. um, about about heady topics. Like, yeah, similar, but also very different. Similar. but Yeah. And and I would rather have uh, if if I do have any hand in curating this list, then I would rather have small, heady sci fi than big, loud, shallow sci fi. Personally, sure. I mean, absolutely. You, you can even call Eternal Sunshine a small, heady sci fi movie, you know? Yeah, I think um, so. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So sounds like your vote's going to be yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, same. I'm going to do that too. I, it's, it's not even, it's, it's an easy decision for me. Um, I think this is one of the, the best science fiction films of the 21st century. Um, it is interesting and I I think I will continue to watch it and continue to glean new things from it and that, and change my opinion on it. Um, I, I recommend everyone, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen it, go watch it. If you haven't seen it in a while, give it a rewatch. I I promise you, you will take new things from it. It's just that type of movie. And this is what I love. Uh, I, I hope that Alex Garland keeps making things like this because I love them. Um, that my only hesitation would have been, would I prefer this or annihilation? And that only caused me like a moment's pause because I think I would just pick this. I, I loved annihilation. I truly loved that movie. It's another great Alex Garland exploration of weird sci-fi ideas, but I think this is the the better film. I agree. Yeah, I, I don't have to think too hard about that, actually. Mm-hmm. So that's two yeses from your hosts, but now the choice is up to you. So check the show notes of this very episode. It will take you over to our Patreon account where there will be a poll. You do not have to be a patron. The poll will be open to the public, so you don't have to support us if you don't want to, but you can still vote yes or no in that poll. And we will come back next week to talk about the results of that there poll. So good luck to Ex Machina. We hope you guys see it our way. Yeah, yeah, me too. And that is all we had for you guys this week. If you have any opinions on anything we talked about today, feel free to reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our Twitter account at doofmedia. Of course, you can always find us on our subreddit. That's r slash doofmedia. And if you're not already subscribed to the Doofcast, we encourage you to subscribe and that way you'll never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And you can find this and all of our various Doof Media shows over at our website, doofmedia.com. And if you like this show and any of the shows we do, consider becoming a patron. It will allow you to be a member of the Council of Doof, which gets to nominate these films, then our patrons get to vote on them. And then, uh, so you get to be part of that process. You get to be part of that process from from one part or, or all the parts or whatever. Uh, so head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and consider subscribing to us there's on top of getting to pick these movies there's a bunch of other bonus subscriber content that uh, we think you guys will really like including matt we just released a new episode of our other levels of the tower series which is our kind of kingslingers adjacent series where we talk about adaptations of stephen king stories uh this month we talked about the shawshank redemption a film that we both liked but i what used to be a snob about and we talk about why why that was and how i've seen the light it was sort of a journey of rediscovering how great this movie was for both of us actually yeah yeah for sure but also please consider rating and reviewing the doofcast on apple podcasts every review helps us to get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here 
All right, folks, that's going to do it for this week. We will be back next week. We're catching up with our Deconstructing Cameron series once again, and we will be taking a look at Cameron's The Abyss. Oh my gosh, Matt. Are you ready? Are you ready for The Abyss? I don't know, man. I don't know. (laughs) We'll be doing that next week. And you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.